This episode is brought to you by Practicerie. Practicerie is a graphic design company that specializes in custom visual branding and websites for therapists. Their combined experience in design, marketing, and the mental health field are perfectly aligned to help you create a look and feel for your business that will showcase your authentic style, expertise, and make your ideal client not only say, I found the one, but feel it from the second they interact with your brand. Mention this podcast episode to get $100 off one full branding or website package and listen to the end of the episode for more information. You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Welcome back, Modern Therapist. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. I'm Kurt Widhelm with Katie Vernoy, and this is the podcast where we talk about all of the things that happen to and around therapists and their lives and showing up in the world in the ways that we are talking about mental health advocacy and a lot of different ways. And today we are super fortunate to be joined by Doug Friedman, licensed clinical social worker and one of the hosts of the Your Mental Breakdown podcast, which is this fabulous foray into what therapy sessions are actually like. And if you haven't heard this podcast before, it's actually real therapy sessions with real clients. It's not made up. It's not reenacted in any sort of way. And we are here to talk about all of the wonderful ways of showing up in this capacity. So thank you so much for joining us today, Doug. You're very welcome. Thank you guys for having me. Before I let you introduce yourself, I just have to say you reached out to me. I was like, oh my gosh, blast from the past. We <laughs> We were like ships crossing in the night at a mental health organization that I will remain nameless, but it was something where both of us have now broken out of the public mental health sphere and are both having podcasts. And so it's so good to see you again, Doug. And I'm going to ask you the question I ask all of our guests, who are you and what are you putting out into the world? Well, well the who are you? That's That's the deep one that will take me back to my philosophy classes in college, but I'll just go with the, what I'm putting out in the world. I, I'm The therapy podcast for me is one that I got very passionate about because I am passionate about therapy. I think all of us are, you'd have to be to go into this line of work and just personal growth. And there's something about the, the stigma of what it is to be in therapy or be a therapist that has always bothered me because personal growth is something I think we can all be committed to and can be a wonderful thing. The idea that therapy is only when something's wrong is inaccurate. And I think what's out there in social media are a lot of sound bites and a lot of you know self-help things that are packaged wonderfully, but it doesn't really give you a feel for what therapy is. So I really wanted to put out what therapy is, at least with me, with a client. So you get to follow along through his sessions and it's so far, our first season was six months of therapy with one person. So you really get to follow along for the arc of it and see what it's like and see what therapists sound like. My co-host is also a therapist and the two of us have known each other forever. So you get to hear what therapists sound like outside of the office, which I think is something people wonder about and never really know and sometimes don't even want to know. <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> right? Well, and I think that uh, on that note, as far as what what therapists should be or what p therapists think that people should think about them kind mm -hmm. of leads to a question that we have moved up early in the episode it, it, and for a learning point is what do therapists often get wrong? As you've been around <laughs> in the field for a while, that right. if, if we can share some of the mistakes that we've done or seen that can help other people from making some of those same mistakes... What do therapists get wrong? That's a, it's a great question. And I think the answer is in your question. If you can look at that and ask that, then you're not getting anything wrong. It's, it's about learning and constantly evolving. If you can do that as a therapist, I think you're ahead of the game. That, that's, that's getting it right. When I see therapists hold a modality or a theory so rigidly, and they can't bring either their personality or themselves to it, and they can only use that structure and nothing else. That to me is fairly limiting. It can still be effective. 
especially if you're following an evidence-based practice where there is a certain model, you have 16 weeks and you follow it this way, it's fine. You know, it, it works. But I think as a as a therapist, your question was, what do therapists get wrong? Not what is wrong with a modality. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it's the inability to look at yourself and self-reflect and grow as a therapist. If you can do that, it's not about making a mistake. It's about learning. That's, I think that's, that's so powerful because I think oftentimes when people move into an area of I'm, I'm an expert or I should be an expert and we're, you know, masters or above professionals, typically, I guess there's different requirements in different countries, but generally we're, we're well-educated and certified and licensed and those types of things. And I think there's, to me, kind of this I'm going to use the cliche, the imposter syndrome that can come up where people then feel like they have to be perfect and they can't question themselves. They can't, Mm. they can't go to a place of what have I been doing wrong, whether it's a fear of liability or even just a fear of not being good enough. right? Right. And, and so the, the way you answer this question just leads me to like, well, of course you would answer that way because (laughs) you're willing to put it all out in front of everyone and being a a therapist with a big audience, you know? And so I, I, when you were talking about kind of decreasing stigma and and identifying my words, not yours, but like, and identifying how therapy is actually done and how therapists talk about therapy. It's a beautiful concept, but in reality, it means that you're out swinging in the wind. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. Sure. And so how, how did you come up with this idea? Because it sounds so vulnerable to be an, an, a therapist who is a human with, with flaws and, and imperfections. Right. And even the way that you do it is like you and Meredith start breaking it down and talking about it. And she's like, oh, I would have done it different. You know, whatever it is, like it, right. it seems to me that there's a huge vulnerability and a willingness to look at yourself. Mm. How did you do that? How did you come up with that? <laughs> I'd love to take full credit for that. Uh, maybe it's part of my my journey. I was raised by a therapist mom. I, I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing, but <laughs> it's um, it, it's something where I have a performance arts background. I was a musician and an actor. So being on display, when you're somebody else as an actor was fine. When it was yeah. me as a musician, it was very personal and vulnerable. And to me, therapy is almost an extension of that. I, I'm not necessarily performing, but to a degree, we're, we're in the room with the client. I think being a little bit eclectic and creative in the moment is wonderful. It, what, it's what keeps me going as a therapist. And to use that and show people that you can use that, not just holding a modality or a theory sacred, is what I wanted to put out and show people. And to be clear, you're hearing me with one client right now. Um, we're hoping to bring in other clients and, and give people a different taste because I sound different with different clients. I don't sure. necessarily use a whole different modality. It's the same conversational style that I think you guys, at least from your podcast, you seem to have. I, I would assume that your work is similar. Mm-hmm. And that's what resonates with people. So for me, at the core of this podcast is, is it serving the client? Mm-hmm. And what I love is talking to some of my friends that happen to be therapists. And they'll say, yeah, I heard you you leading him this way instead of l- letting him find this. It worked, but I would have done this. I yeah. love that. I love hearing that from, from people. I, I don't think it's anything I did wrong to go back to what you were asking, Kurt. I, I think it's something that I can learn from and recognize. And it happens to work for this client and it works fairly well. So putting that on display, honestly, I think we should all do that. I don't know that it would be that compelling for people to listen to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think if if we just sort of open it up... I, I've heard stories from clients, I I wonder if you guys have too, where they come in and go, gosh, my last therapist wasn't like this at all. They were like this. And I thought I was doing it wrong. And it bothers me so much. And I just, the idea that there are so many different therapists out there, what I'm putting out there is therapy with me and this client, not this is how therapy should be done, right? Sure. As the resident law and ethics 
co-host on our podcast. <laughs> I, 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 I know that there's a, a lot of questions that come up with how are you managing this relationship? And I know that you've, you've used the pseudonym Drew with the, the client that you've been working with on your show. Right. How do you handle the issues around the confidentiality, the extra dual relationship that having your audience preview into his life not get in the way of the therapy and the the productive goals that you're working on with him? Yeah, it, it's not as hard as you think, or maybe it is, I don't know. The confidentiality part was fairly easy if you think of a getting a, a release for a client to do video or audio. You know, I, I imagine that that release that. is just kind of like, I'm going to share this with everybody against everything for everywhere. And you're right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and there's nothing you can do about it, which is not true. There is something he can do about it. And I've told him this. I nearly say it every week, every week before we start the session, we'll chit chat for a minute and I'll say, are you, you cool if I record? You still want to do this? If at any point he says, no, it's over. And that's, that's something that to me, again, it's about the client, right? But yeah. before I even sat down to record and do the podcast, I called the NASW and the camp's legal and ethics departments and talked to them about it. And they were pretty open about, well, you can record for educational purposes. And as long as the client is consenting and knows what's happening, there's no issue there. You're okay. So I was just very open with the client and screening for the client, which is a question some of our listeners had, like, how did you find this client? I had a few clients that were interested in recording and being podcast, one of whom was fairly well known. And I said, no, because the confidentiality would not be there. It wouldn't be in place. And it would mm -hmm. be a different kind of show if it was me doing therapy with, uh, you know, I don't know, George Clooney. Um, yeah. <laughs> and who was not the one I'm talking about. No, I figured. <laughs> I not know him, right? um, then it's a different show entirely. And there is no confidentiality because people know exactly who that is. Mm -hmm. So anything that has come up with the client that would identify him, we take out in editing. Anything that he's not comfortable with, he would take out. We did one episode early on where he talked about his tattoos and what they mean to him. And we cut that out of the actual session that we had. Then later he said, you know, I actually like that. I, I'm cool with that being out there. So we did a kind of a bonus clip of just talking about his, his tattoos. So it, it's really guided by him and what he wants to do and what he's comfortable with. Right. D does he listen to the podcast? He did at first. And I think his, <laughs> his big fear in the beginning was that his mom would hear the podcast mm. and he's got a history with mom. There's some family issues. And they were fairly unresolved. So having it be broadcast for him was very scary. He was nervous. He realized there's no way his mom is going to find the podcast. There's no way. It just would not happen unless he told her. And he hasn't. Mm. So even his friends don't know that it's happening. He's told one friend because he was proud of it and wanted the friend to hear it. And that was pretty cool for him. And he's heard, I, I'd say, a handful of the first few sessions just as it was novelty. And then he wasn't that interested in, in going back through it because he was living his own life and doing his own thing. But he'll ask me about certain things in terms of the chronology, where we are in the podcast, where we are in real life. He gets to look back and we can relive some certain things. For example, season one ended right before his brother's wedding. And what he had to work through around that for him was pretty intense at the time. Now, when he and I are talking, it's nearly a year past when the wedding took place. So he can look back and go, wow, you guys are just putting that one out. Man, I remember what I was like then. And it was this. And oh, my God, I've grown so much. <laughs> Which, again, is why I think everybody could benefit from having their sessions recorded or at least in some way being able to reflect and look back. Another aspect that I, I really like in my approach to learning as a therapist is this deliberate practice and going back and reviewing your sessions and replaying them, rehashing them out. How have you changed as a therapist in your work with Drew and mm. how, how have you grown and made adjustments based on what you're hearing? Because there are sessions that I hear, there are sessions that of myself, there are sessions that I hear from 
my supervisees that I'm playing with them that are like, man, I hate the way that I sound. <laughs> and right. those are often points, <laughs> growing points for us. But how have you changed? Sure. Oh, man. Um, I guess I can answer that by saying I haven't at all. And I have tremendously. I think what I was answering you before in saying having that ability to self-reflect as a therapist and as a person is a wonderful tool uh, for growth. So I apply that to listening to myself. I, I think back to when we were in school and we had to do that. I know I never know if it's called a one-way mirror or two-way mirror, but where everybody's sure, the, watching the, the, you. The mirror thing, yeah. Right, the, the mirror <laughs> thing, you know, uh, <laughs> where everybody's watching you and listening to you. And it's the most uncomfortable experience. And any new therapist, a therapist in school knows it is so nerve wracking and horrible. And it was no different for me as a performer. Sure. That's fine. But in the therapy room, it was so uncomfortable. I mean, I was afraid to move. I was afraid to to reach for a glass of water and take a drink. I, I mean, I didn't want to send any of the wrong messages to anybody. And I think back to how I've been over the years as a therapist. And one of the things that's been constantly evolving is how much more experience I have and how much more comfort I have in myself uh, as a as a therapist and in the room i think listening to sessions is a little different for me because i'm i'm listening with an editor's ear so i'm i'm listening for other things and i've gone past the idea of i don't like the sound of my own voice as a musician i had to get over that pretty quickly and you're just listening in a different way but I, I will definitely hear things and Meredith will call me out on it. Like, oh, you said this. I wouldn't have said that. Like you said, his integrity is good. What do you mean good? Why are you putting a judgment on it? Like, oh, well, okay. And she goes back to the DBT. I, I think more of using words like effective and ineffective. And I'll go, oh, that's that's great. Okay. I don't necessarily hear it myself in a session and go, man, why did I say that? But I, I have had the experience of wondering why I went a certain direction, and then I will make reference to the direction I could have gone in later in that recording. And I think, oh, good, good. Phew, phew. I got, I got through that. I'm, <laughs> okay, all right. I'm not as bad as I thought. I'm not as bad. And that imposter syndrome, even for me, creeps up sometimes too, for sure. We almost need a meta episode where we have Meredith listen to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. What's, what's ironic, Kurt, is that, okay, so my mom's a therapist. My wife was a therapist. My best friends are therapists. I, and Katie might remember this from when we worked together in the clinic, I hated talking clinically. I hated going to any sort of trainings. I, 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 I don't read therapy books. I don't like it. And for some reason, it's just crept into this is how I think and this is what I talk about. And it is what I absorb and, and discuss all the time. It's wild. That's so funny. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that you're talking about hating the mirror thing. And you've basically created that as your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. So we, we go, you lean into the fear. That's the one thing I've learned. Lean into it, right? <laughs> so we've mentioned Meredith, who is your co-host, and, yes. and you told us you've known her for 30 years. That's right. How did this get started? And, and how did, how is it, what's it like working with someone that you've known that long in that way? Yeah. And, you know, I, I guess if we're Technical, it's probably closer to 35 years, but we'll go with 30. All right, all right. Better, right? <laughs> um, I, I have a feeling that Katie's asking this just to preview what our relationship's going to be like. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how did you guys meet? How did you guys start? But it's not 30 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Feels like it. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it's something that that I think you guys experience is the rapport that you have with somebody that you know well and that, that mm -hmm. you trust. And that is at the core. I think we mentioned on a recent episode that the podcast idea was one that my wife and I had had and she had passed away. But we had tried to come up with different incarnations of a podcast. And it was based on the fact that we could talk therapy. We had witty banter and we could call each other out on things coming from a place of love. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't from a place of harsh criticism, you know, and, and it was inquiry. And oddly, my sister said, why don't you do it with Meredith? Because she knows Meredith as well. And I just kind of mm -hmm. went, no. <laughs> no <way. laughs> um, 
Meredith, it can be unfiltered, sometimes impulsive, abrasive, and very thoughtful. She's one of the smartest people I know. But at the core of it is a love that we have for one another. And she can be that way with me. She can literally say to me, like, you said this to Drew. What the fuck was that? <laughs> it's the internet. You can cuss. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Now you get the little explicit E on your podcast. Yeah. You yes, know, yes, um, of course. Yeah, Meredith will love that the only time I cursed was when I was channeling her. Um, <laughs> right? And it, it's something that when she, when a colleague says that to me that I don't know very well, if they said that, why did you do that? I, I would instantly like get defensive or feel, like it would mm-hmm. take me a moment to lean into, oh, that we're just having a discussion about this. But with Meredith and, and our history, And the way we are, I know where she's coming from and and it's okay. And we can clash and we can disagree on things. We happen to agree on a lot, which isn't the greatest for, you know, making a a compelling podcast, but (laughs) I think we disagree on enough that it it keeps it going. I I don't know for you guys, if if you guys have clashed and if you clash and it's okay because you have a relationship. I think team Kurt is still winning, but I know (laughs) team Katie is definitely winning. I've got way more people on the team Katie train. (laughs) Well, no, I think that we actually purposely have made sure that we fully identify our, our perspectives because early on we were agreeing a lot and it was super boring. And I was like, why am I agreeing (laughs) with you? Like some of it I do, but like, I'm just kind of like playing smaller or like he was agreeing with me and wouldn't call me out on stuff. I'm like, wait a second. So so there's been, there's been some episodes that were, that that we needed to have a timeout and then come back and talk to each other afterwards. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. And we've gotten some feedback from listeners kind of going, why does Meredith always agree with Doug? And Meredith answered that one when we did a mailbag episode. She went, cause he's amazing. I'm like, no, call me out. out." (laughs) And then after that, for the next two weeks, she made it a point to like find things she could disagree with, which I thought was interesting. What's more interesting to me is when we have people on the show, we've done two roundtable episodes with two other therapists and we have different approaches. So having Mm -hmm. people from a different approach talk uh, and sort of look at a breakdown or look at like an issue that, that had come up is really interesting to me. In fact, some of the most interesting discussions we've had are when we cut the the roundtable episode when we're done recording and just the four of us are talking and we just, yeah. you know, and I, every time think, man, I should have just kept recording because this is really cool. This yeah. is where you get to hear difference of opinion and, and difference of thing. And people are more comfortable when the red light is off and the mic is not recording and they can speak more freely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've had some of those where we keep talking after the, that rec- we've both stopped recording and I'm like, oh, this would have been so juicy to put right into that podcast right? episode. So well, let me ask you guys something, because it's something that I take for granted that I went to a performing arts high school. I was I've been you know acting and playing music and had mics in front of me for 30, 35 years. Meredith had never had a microphone in front of her before we started. And she just wasn't comfortable with this. I, I mm-hmm. wonder for you guys what it's been like, because it, I mean, we are podcasting. It, it's something that's happening much more prominently now for a lot of people, but being a therapist, we're used to just talking in a room with somebody, or if you're lecturing or leading a group supervision, but for you guys, how is the transition to having a mic in front of you and, and talking and being recorded and doing this this way? Well, Katie was an actor in training. For yeah. A, I was a, a theater major theater ah. psychology double major. So for me, it was not a big deal. Um, gotcha. But but I actually, I haven't asked this question of Kurt. How was it for you? So I grew up doing a lot of public speaking. And this started when I was really young, like eight, nine, 10 years old. I was giving speeches to the Montana legislature on oh, wow. <laughs> funding the 4-H program. And so <laughs> I, I grew up with microphones and live audiences and large audience at when I was in high school, I think was my first like speech in front of a thousand person audience. So oh, wow. Wow. I have always been comfortable in front of people and <laughs> refining myself. So it, 
in almost kind of the the reverse way. Podcasting was almost kind of a we're talking to lots of people, but there's only one person that we're talking yeah. to or two people if we have guests. That that was right. a little bit harder right. of the transition for me. Right. Well, and like what you were saying, Doug, I think the the issue for me was I had done mostly acting. I did send some singing as well. And and especially in high school and college, I did less. But it's it's really easy if you're playing a role and, and right. you have lines. <laughs> Right. Um, right. But I, but when I, actually when I was at the clinic and I ended up kind of running a lot of meetings and doing stuff as a director at the at the end, I had to learn how to speak in front of a large group of people a lot. So so I had finally gotten over kind of fear around public speaking. I guess that's one of the good things the clinic gave me. <laughs> but yeah, so I think it was. It feels like it's been fairly natural. I think the the question I have related to, to you and Meredith and kind of having that transition, you know, with the the recording and creating that content, it seems like there are a number of different places where there could be challenges. You've got the client session and the client could bulk or, or have so much identifying information. It becomes almost unusable. You've got, you know, the breakdown and, right. and you and Meredith talking, there's the editing, there's, you know, kind of sorting through, like, it, it seems to me like, it just feels harder than what Kurt and I are doing. So <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> very, very poorly in the beginning. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was overwhelmed with how much I was doing and it was sickening how many times I would listen to an episode, which consisted of the intro that Meredith and I do the session and the outro that we do and trying to edit it, going through, going through it with a transcript, like listening to it, having the transcript. It was, it was brutal. I listened to an episode maybe three or four times before it actually got done. And Mm -hmm. that was way too much. So I put together a team. We have a, an audio engineer. You know, she's had to go through NDAs and confidentiality as well. And the client was comfortable with that. Going back to the law and ethics issue. Yeah. There. You know, now we've got a pretty good flow and a pretty good rhythm. It's it's interesting now to me that I'll hear an episode right before Meredith and I record, and it's from six months or a year ago. Mm. So it's really interesting to then hear what I was doing back in that time. And I go through it and Meredith and I, you know, will do our intro and do the outro and the breakdown. And then it's in the hands of a, of an audio engineer. So I, I don't have anything to do with that part. I'll give it one more listen through to make sure any identifiers were taken out. But I do that in one pass before that. So th- there's, there is a lot of work. It, it takes a lot of work and it's something that I'm very passionate about. I would have to be because there is no money in it. It is actually costing me money. At some point, maybe we'll, people have said like, where's the merch? I want the t-shirt. Like, uh, okay, yeah, we'll probably put that out too. But it's, it becomes a machine and it's, when it's well oiled, it's wonderful. When it's squeaky, it's tough and you just want to get out of the machine and not have anything to do with it. So it's, it's been a, a passion project and very difficult. I don't recommend doing necessarily a podcast this way to anybody, but I would say if you are interested in putting something out there, absolutely do it and find the way that works for you. I will say too, that that part of doing this podcast this way, one of the things that I thought of that was an inspiration for it was Esther Perel's podcast, which I think is fantastic. It is heavily, heavily produced. It is one session, one time with a client, and she cuts it and edits it and talks and intersperses her own talking throughout the the episode. I wanted to do something that was more authentic, that was just playing to not necessarily my strength, but playing to what I already do, which is sessions with a client. So it really was just finding the right client, being able to, to, to do with him. And then everything else was very difficult in the beginning just to find the flow and the rhythm and it's become easier. I would not say it's easy, but it's, it's very rewarding when I hear the feedback that we're getting. One of the ways that you go about your podcast, you, you talked about you know, kind of the, the professional evaluation of you, but as compared to Katie and my relationship right. where when we talk about 
ourselves on the practice, uh, when we talk about ourselves on the podcast, it tends to be about our practices, or it tends to be about how we represent ourselves professionally in the community. Your podcast also tends to look a little bit more at you as a person, too, and some of the ways that your personal life Mm. is interweaved Mm -hmm. in and out. How has that been for you over the, the duration of your show of potentially having people see both this professional side of you as well as this personal side of you in a way that Katie and I really don't do here? Yeah, and that's something where I guess I'm pretty open and vulnerable as it is. So I'm okay and comfortable with that. Some people would not be. And I think that's sort of breaking down what it is to be a therapist. I don't like therapists that just kind of are that wall where you don't know anything about them yeah. and they stick to something, like I said before, rigidly. Like, I think the nature of our podcast, yeah, Meredith and I are giving you a sense of our personalities. And that's part of what we wanted to do and show that therapists are people too. The idea that they're the experts, you know, Katie, you mentioned that earlier. And I think when I think of us as experts and what I've told my, my interns that I've had before in the past is that clients are coming to you knowing that you're an expert knowing that if you don't know the answer, you have the tools to find the answer. You'll either pick up a book, consult with somebody else, find an answer and come back to them with a direction to go to. The mistake that I think, going back to Kurt's earlier question, some therapists make is that they have to have the right answer in the room at the right time. That's not true. Being an expert doesn't mean you know everything right there at your fingertips. It means you have the ability to find the thing that's going to help the person. And it might not be in the room in that moment, but it, over the course of treatment, it's going to be there. I don't know if that answers the question about putting myself on display, but we'll go with it. Right? <laughs> right. Well, it kind of leads to to another question I have, because I know, obviously, there's Drew, who is having his therapy as a podcast. Clearly, there are other clients who may be also listening. And I always, I'm always curious about kind mm. of if my clients are listening, I know I've been on other people's podcasts and I've had like, oh, I heard you on this other podcast. And I was like, oh, sure. okay. But thinking about that and kind of how clients are getting this window, not only into what Kurt was talking about, kind of your personal life. I, I re- recently listened to your This Is Us episode and and there's a mm. lot of personal information there, but sure. they're also hearing you work with someone else. Like, have you had... <laughs> Any clients have a response to that? Because it would be like, well, but oh, you yeah. don't do that with me or, right. you know, those kinds of things. Like, do you have any yep. of that? Yep. A fantastic question. I love that one. Um, and that's one that I thought of. In fact, in, in the same way that Drew was nervous about having his mom listen, I was almost nervous with, you know, the dozen or so 20 clients that I have, like, what are they going to think? What are they going to say? Because I have a relationship with them. Mm-hmm. I've had one client say, I, I don't think I can listen to it. I, I mean. I want you for myself. And it's almost that idea of, I I don't want to know that you have any other clients but me, which for the hour or 50 minutes that I'm talking to you, nobody else exists. So I I understand that. I do have several clients that have found the podcast. I don't necessarily promote it to my clients at all. Mm -hmm. If they find it or they ask about it, great. The ones that listen, they love it. They love that, that it reinforces. They feel like they're getting a bonus you know, therapy session every week and they hear <laughs> awesome. objectively how someone else is going through something and working on something that maybe we've worked on, but they have a subjective experience for themselves. They can look at it objectively with someone else. So they, they love it. They'll, they'll, they know some of the stories that I've told Drew, they know some of the analogies that I use and, and they like it because it reinforces it, you know, especially for some clients, you know, like to take notes during a session right? Mm-hmm. They like to like write things down and remember things. This is a way that current clients of mine can get that without having to actually write notes and do the work. What's been the most surprising part of your yeah. process so far? I would say actually, <laughs> there's nothing to do with therapy, but a couple of friends that I have in LA that I met, our dogs became friends and we hiked together and they're, they're from Minnesota. And being in LA, they were at a dinner party and they were talking about podcasts and somebody had mentioned our podcast and they said, Oh, we know that guy. Like he's, he's a friend of ours. We hike with him. And then the next week when we got together, uh, it's a husband and wife and, and their dog. And, and the, the wife said, um, wow, you're like the most famous person we've met in LA. 
And I just couldn't <laughs> stop laughing. But, nah, I'm not famous. I'm not remotely famous. I, I grew up in LA around famous people. I know famous. I am not that at all. Yeah. But for them, the, it was something like, oh, there's this public persona that you have that's that's different. So that that to me surprised me because I never thought that, that I honestly didn't think that many people would be listening. Grateful that they are. But the thought that I might be mentioned at a dinner party somewhere is very surprising and, and ridiculous and wonderful. <laughs> Our guest today is Doug Friedman. Where can people find out more about you, your practice, and your show? I am everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, on, on the web, you can find me. The, the podcast is called Your Mental Breakdown. So we're at yourmentalbreakdown.com. We're on all the social medias. If you put that in, you'll find it. My private practice is called Clear Mind Full Heart. You can find that on the web, clearmindfullheart.com. We will include links to all of that in our show notes. You can find those at mtsgpodcast.com. And until next time, I'm Kurt Woodhelm with Katie Renoy and Doug Friedman. Thanks again to our sponsor, Practicery. Practicery is a graphic design company that was founded by Kimberly and Justin Slagle, a husband and wife team who are passionate about authentic, purposeful, custom visual branding and web design that's made to match you, not your neighbor and everyone else down the block. Every visual representation of your brand is an opportunity to build a genuine connection with your ideal client, from your logo to your beautifully and strategically designed website. But if you're getting lost in the crowd or haven't quite found your footing yet, you could be missing out on those big old juicy paydays, or at the very least, helping more people. Visit Practicery's website at practicery.com to schedule a free phone console and learn more about how their awesome team can help kick your marketing up a notch or a 10. And join Practicery's Facebook group, Therapists Who Brand, for lots of great branding and marketing resources, expert advice, and networking opportunities. Mention this podcast episode to get $100 off your purchase of either a full branding or website package. Once again, practicery.com. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes.